Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and our Community Matters show, which is now focusing on the upcoming election. You know, that's less than a month away, folks. I, and um, it, it's going to be probably one of the most significant moments in American history. Today, our particular focus is on the media. And the media is such a broad category these days. And uh, we're not only we're not only talking about what people call the social media, which will be obviously a part of the discussion, but also what is in fact the traditional media and 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 uh, and how they react and what they have caused or are causing to influence the election. In fact, the subject matter is so complex in a sense that we had to invite a few professors from the University of Hawaii to help educate us on, uh, uh, on this phenomenon. And uh, even if we do normally have a professor with us every time we do this show, we had to get a few of his colleagues. So I want to welcome Brett Opagard, welcome, and Julian Gorbach, who are here with us. And of course, we have our usual culprits from the uh, University of Hawaii as well. We have Colin Moore. And from the media, we have Chad Blair from Civil Beat. And of course, our technician, overall commentator, we have Jay Fidel. Guys, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Julian, for coming. We want to, why don't we start off with you? And just give us uh, a little bit of uh, what you see as the current state of affairs with regard to the coverage of elections in, in America and, and Hawaii. So uh, who goes first, uh, Julian or, or Brett? Uh, it's just interesting in your opening, um, I was getting my hair cut the other day and my barber was talking to me about, uh, you know, the state of affairs and what was going on in politics and whatnot. And his he said to me something sort of striking uh, that, you know, you can't trust, basically he said, you can't trust anybody about anything anymore. And he was probably sorry I was sitting in the chair because then I said, then I, you know, followed up with kind of uh, a, a classroom of media literacy uh, techniques on, on uh, display when I asked, well, what kind of media are we talking about? What specifically don't you trust? What are your sources? And, you know, digging down into that, I think it uh, pretty much is symbolic of the way uh, mass media has uh, deteriorated around its borders and what people think about as media. Um, basically, the barber considered anything he saw on his uh, Instagram to be the, the quote unquote media. Everything was untrustworthy. You know, I asked what sources he followed. He he wasn't following the New York Times. I'll say that. And um, that leads to this perception that he and the fellow barbers in the room were all, you know, kind of ch chiming in as well that uh, the media system's broken. There's nothing true and there's nothing we can do about it. What do you want to add to that, Julian? Well, I mean, I guess I just underscore it a little bit. Um, I think that the fragmentary nature of it um, is having all kinds of uh, effects where, we, you know, it, it, it's all becoming kind of a blur in a way. Uh, and a lot of um, falsehoods can get through that way. And, you know, to Brett's point about the barber, um, then that engenders a kind of cynicism that's a bit of a poison to democracy. Um, and I, I'm not sure there's any way for a lot of the the kind of major players in the media to claw their way back. Um, I, you know, I've been, I guess I've had the, the recent vice presidential debate on my mind because there was, you know, that's been the one thing that there's been a lot of the most recent sort of domestic oriented coverage of. Um, and I think there were a lot of errors with that, but then it's, it's so fragmentary that in a way that if we just work up a big critique of, uh, 
the mainstream media, whether we're talking about the New York Times and the Washington Post or, you know, the, the news, the television networks like ABC, CBS, et cetera, uh, I don't know how much that really uh, affects the ultimate outcome, especially, you know, I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that we're this deeply divided country now with something like 4% of people according to, to to some analysts saying that they're they're undecided and then who those people are and how they get media is one way to sort of focus the question of what is media anymore you know what is it what is it i mean can we even generalize about it except by saying it's so fragmentary so chad what do you think of these uh statements? i'll say uh, two things just adding to what both brad and julian said uh, who I know and and have been to our offices before, and we're glad to work with them. One important point to remember is that exaggeration on the part of politicians, and Colin, I know, knows this, has been part of the American landscape <laughs> since the very beginning. People telling lies. I mean, I I think it was goes back to Thomas Jefferson and whether he was uh, sleeping with one of his slaves, and and I mean, I could name any other example and so forth. Uh, I think we do tend to forget that politicians, by their very nature, exaggerate, if not actually lie. But when a majority of Republicans nationally, and I believe it's a very healthy majority, not healthy, substantive majority, believe that the 2020 election was stolen, that just takes it to a whole nother level. Because if for some reason the race is tight, it sure looks that way. There's already legal challenges that have been filed, and who knows what's going to come after November the 5th. I think we're all expecting it, win or lose, Trump or Harris. When you have this foundational lie that has been accepted and propagated by the former president of the United States who wants to be in the office again, it just takes it to a whole nother level. Uh, and, and that's why when Democrats say they are concerned about the history, excuse me, the future of democracy, I think they have a point, a very good one. Julian, maybe I could jump in because you're a historian of journalism and maybe I think people would find it useful if you could sort of give the big picture here. Is there is there anything all that different right now if you look at American journalism from, from the revolution forward? I mean, we all know that there have been partisan newspapers, politicians exaggerate. You know, there's been plenty of fake news in the past. Is Is what we're seeing right now in the coverage of elections or the way the media is operating fundamentally different uh, than in the past? Years ago, this would have been taking us back to 2017. I argued that that what we were seeing was essentially a witch's brew. I mean, you know, of of kind of all the some of the worst elements that we would read about in in the different eras. I mean, like there, there's the partisan press of say the 1800s when uh, parties weren't the political parties weren't really an established thing yet. And there was no concept of kind of the loyal opposition. So the two parties, you know, the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party uh, regarded each other because there had been no previous experience of a Democratic Republic in recent memory. They regarded each other as enemies. And we're definitely seeing that, the kind of ideological warfare that where it's no longer two parties at each other. It's you know, you're trying to destroy the country. No, that you're trying, you know, as if we were talking about a foreign enemy. Um, that's, you know, sort of like the era of the partisan press. But then uh, when you look at the kind of uh, stuff that would go out of control, like you either, you, you know, take your pick, the, the penny press or the era of the yellow press or the, you know, kind of the uh, extremes of the uh, 20s with with money and the way that that can kind of lead things to just where the market takes over and completely, you know, it's one thing, I mean, we've always been, you know, sort of a capitalist oriented media, but when that completely washes out anything else, you can definitely see that at play. Uh, you always can, but the way that it's combining, I think is unique. I mean, I think one thing we have to be careful with always that media historians understand is how much we ascribe I mean, I don't know if this directly asks your question, but as a historian, I just throw it in how much we ascribe to the media itself as a cause and how much of it, you know, sometimes it can be, you know, demographic shifts like the Civil War had a lot to do with the expansion of the country westward. 
But it's easy to look at the, the abolitionist press and all that stuff and say, well, that drove the war, right? But it, you know, and I think now we have to be careful in saying how much of like the Trump phenomenon or the politics that we're dealing with now are really driven, you know, it's that chicken of the egg question. How much of that is really driven by the media versus is, is uh, I mean, you know, Donald Trump, uh, arguably incited January 6th and there was no prosecution of him for two years. And, you know, then the Supreme court stepped in. And so the government never did anything to respond to January 6th either. And, you know, the, the media likes the word permission structure, maybe, uh, the, the sort of between the, our current democratic party and the justice department under Biden and, and the Republican party, um, they've given a permission structure that, Hey, it's okay to stage something like January 6th and there are no consequences. And so maybe more than the media, the American public is taking its cue about uh, Trump's behavior from um, the way our political system has responded to it. The people we elect to be the leaders. You had any point to add, Brett? Well, I just, I, I just emphasize what Julian's saying uh, in, in the respect that, Everybody loves to point fingers at journalists, like not doing their job, and journalists are the reason we're in the situation, and they are there's a big failure of journalism. And I, I think there's some truth to that in the sense that journalists could have done certain things better and and can do things better, but they're not in a vacuum. They're not really like journalists are a reflection of society. They're not, um, you know, necessarily the the leadership structure of how society operates and the you know the the government officials have a big responsibility in in how this plays out the politicians have a responsibility the citizens and how they get their information have responsibilities it's all it's all part of a bigger picture but when you see the fingers being pointed how many people point at themselves and say geez yeah i really should clean up my social media feeds or or point at the um you know, their neighbors who are uh, radicalized and doing crazy things and saying, yeah, these these are the problems. What about the fact, though, that I I, you know, I think it was uh, I'm remembering back uh, a year or some time ago, not that long ago, but uh, I heard uh, kind of an exchange uh, among the um, and I'm trying to remember the names among the owners, the generation, the owners of Fox News. And basically uh, what they were saying, and because the, his son was contributing to the Democratic cause. So this is the owner, it was large, substantial funds were going to, uh, I think it was Biden at, at the time, and, 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 and his dad, and he, and he said something about his dad can't, uh, who, uh, what, 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 what's the, I can't remember his name, but the, the owner Murdoch of, family? Murdoch, yeah, the Murdoch yeah. family. Murdoch. And Bailey, Bailey, Bailey Murdoch says, you know, he can't, he says, my dad can't stand Trump, but he understands money. Mm -hmm. And good business is to be on that side of the equation. So how much discretion do reporters actually have with some of these institutions? And uh, especially, uh, you know, video. I mean, where where you actually sort of an actor. You're not the you know the usual reporter that I was used to when I was in politics was some guy sitting in the corner with a notepad, and he didn't particularly have to you know dress up or anything. He was wearing slippers, walking around the Capitol, and and but he wrote great articles, whatever they were. In fact, some of them were stinging. And, uh, and and the uh, the pretty faces that you need to see on television. I mean, how much of this is driven by by market forces? I'm just going to say that you know, there's uh, if, unless you go back to the print shops of the American Revolution or something, there's always been a number of gatekeepers between the journalists and the audience in terms of editors and other and publishers and uh, other forces that filter that information and to some degree that was a great strength of journalism that um, there were people checking to make sure that uh, the truth for the most part was what uh, circulated to the top and then um, 
you know, publishers at times can can hold hold stories uh, out of certain areas, like having sacred cows of the local car dealers who you don't want to make mad because they're putting all the the advertisements in the newspapers or on, on television. I mean, there has been, I, I think, a great uh, degradation of that sort of um, journalistic, uh, what's the right word here? Uh, aim uh, for television news and it's become more about the economics I'd say than the journalism uh, in general but uh, you know this is a this is a great opportunity it'd be my argument for journalists to reposition themselves economically in society as the trusted truth tellers of the of each community and that when people want information they can trust and they're willing to pay for it then they go to the journalists so I think I think that's actually a great opportunity as well. I just think it's a really complicated question when you talk about money in journalism or money in media. You know, you can tick off various different ways that it influences it. Everything from, you know, the engagement model uh, that news organizations and then social media companies adopted that, you know, just getting people more engaged was a business model in itself. And so that creates more hyper-partisanship and inflames things. You can look at uh, when people were, were looking at the fake news explosion, a lot of that was done by, you know, people in Eastern Europe that were simply found that they could make a lot of money by selling falsehoods that people wanted to believe. Um, you, you can look at the, the kind of the lifestyles, the way that different people who populate newsrooms live and what kind of ideologies are kind of embedded in that. But I also think, you know, I mean, just to, to, to sharpen the point, like Colin had asked about the differences then and now, one of those relates directly to this question of money, which is, um, you know, what's happened until kind of the advent of social media with legacy media is that there were, you know, there became a, a, a real uh, issue of, um, where were you were going to put the limits on what was going to be put on, say, like on in, into newspapers or on the radio airwaves or on television or in or in Hollywood movies. And in every one of those cases, rather than letting Congress step in and have to mess with the First Amendment, um, all of the companies found it in their financial self-interest and also their just long term well-being to self-regulate which they could do much more, um, you know, with a scalpel in terms of, you know, if you had a movie studio and, and you got together with other movie studios, establishing like uh, a, a um, you know, a system for that. Um, and now we have the G ratings and the R ratings, et cetera. The, the social media companies have gone from kind of holding back on that to now going kind of aggressively against the idea of responsibility. I mean, if you look at like Elon Musk as an example, and so that's an example both of like what you asked about the financial uh, motives of some of this, like they're obviously seeing that they can make money by just being, you know, by having no limits on content and not trying to regulate it all. Um, but it's also like a huge break from the past. It's one thing that's really different. I mean, another thing that's really different is that we used to have these gatekeepers, right? I mean, and just that needs, that point needs to be underscored because I didn't make it originally that you, you know, used to have in the days of Walter Cronkite, you, you had people with a shared set of facts and that's disintegrated. And we can argue whether there was another time in history when it was like that, but certainly the structural aspects of the internet and of social media have really enabled us to be living in our own realities. And at some point, you got to wonder if that living in your own reality becomes, we end up with very different values. We end up very different people altogether when we've lived, you know, we're now however many years into the social media experience. What happens when you live in your own reality or your own filter bubble? for 10, 15, 20 years. Like, where does it go from there? These things, a lot of these things we've commented on over the years that we've had YouTube and Facebook and all that, but they continue changing. We're less responsible about content moderation than we were in 2017 and 2018, which I don't know if anyone would have expected that. 
but you know Elon Musk taking over Twitter is is you know and 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 Mark Zuckerberg is announcing you know he's he's been signaling to the Trump administ you know the Trump campaign that hey you don't have to worry about us if you take power will we won't be a problem yeah and you know I, just to show that uh, this is not necessarily only for crazies I I one of the sites that I just put on my uh, in my daily week, which is uh, just because it there is something called nice news, <laughs> and they go all over the world and they pick the most, um, you know, all the really sweet articles. And I don't know who would read this stuff actually, but at a certain point, but it's it's nice to know that I have nice news in my little daily week <laughs> over here. So there's apparently there's a market for. Well, that kind of stuff too. So Jay, you haven't had a chance to get in on this, so why don't you? Well, I've been listening. Brett, I agree with you, Barbara. Um, uh, I agree with Julian that it's it's different, way different than it was only a few years ago. Um, I believe that the Trump phenomenon, which uh, he was trying to manipulate the press when he was doing real estate, uh, and he's been trying to manipulate the press ever since he got into office, has has had a huge damage effect on the media and the First Amendment. I believe the First Amendment is broken. Uh, in order to have the First Amendment work properly, you have to have um, you know, journalists who have the context, who study civics, who know the history. And you have to have journalists who call it out in, in whatever strident way they need to to make you know, the liar accountable. Uh, we've had huge numbers of lies from Trump, you know, unprecedented, and from his friends. Um, and people are numb. You know, the, the paper, the papers and, and the media in general, at least the media that's uh, accountable, uh, started calling these lies by the name lies or falsehoods back in, what, 2017 or 2018. Um, and ev every time he lies, they say it's a falsehood. OK, good. But there's a numbness that has settled in. And so you have to have not only the journalists who, you know, who who give you the context, who point it out, you have to have a public that wants the truth. But we don't have that anymore. Um, they are mm, being corrupted on both sides of the equation. The only uncorrupted media in the country is Civil Beat, by the way, Chad. I want to mention that. Yeah. And it's little brother and it's little brother think tank. <laughs> thank you, thank you, John. But I have a question for both Julian and Brett because I know we're, you know, at a time on the Q and A. Yeah. And Julian, you mentioned that um, you know we need at some point to claw back the First Amendment. We need to rebuild the notion of the First Amendment. We need to rebuild trust, as Brett was talking. Um, we need to recreate, you know, this fundamental proposition. Uh, to sustain our democracy. My question to both of you is, how in the world do we do that? Because we have suffered profound damage. How do we reverse direction? Brett, <laughs> you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, well, I've been arguing for a long time. I don't know, it's never really had much traction, but if you take away the, um, the exemption- 30. Yeah, you take away the exemption in the law that social media publishers are not responsible for what content circulates and they can be sued for it. And I think that takes a, that makes a, that's like a nuclear bomb on the whole social media economic model. And then suddenly, and, and if also, if you, if you make each person operating on social media, a publisher who can also be sued, then suddenly you're including when they retweet things or re you know recirculate just as, which is what publishers do if you if a publisher republishes uh some libelous content they can also be sued so there's not there's not a restriction on you know civil beat or right but Brett, like how it. do you deal with the the threat from Donald Trump who says yeah I'd love to see that the New York Times case turned around uh, I'd love to be able to sue them I'd sue them all day long I'd sue them on completely spurious claims i would put them out of business with defamation suits how do you how do you respond to that he already can what's stopping him he can sue he can sue the new york times all day long and the law says no the new york times case oh the, the case, the case well, that gives them the exemption 
Well, that's the the law of the land. I'm saying the the law can be changed. The law of the land also is that social media companies are exempt from this kind of pressure, and uh, I think that it would be healthy to bring that back into play. That's, that's called uh, Section 230. It's it's from the 1996 Communi Communication Decency Act, which was a uh, the last time I think we revamped the the night, you know, or the last major time we revamped the 1930s communication law that, you know, established the rules for radio and the airwaves. And uh, what he's saying is with Section 230, nothing that basically the, the, the platforms <laughs> are considered legally and they haven't changed this since 1996 with the entire growth that we've had of social media since then that Facebook and X are are deemed from a legal perspective like uh the, the the telegraph wires or the you know they're the they're the plumbing they're the and they have no responsibility for the the electricity or whatever that goes through their pipes um that a, than a you know a pipe system would and what brett is saying is see the difference between you know movie studios and and television studios and newspapers and radio and and these social media companies is that all those legacy media companies understood they had responsibility for what they put out and so he's saying one thing that would clean this up and and by the way you know to jay's point no it would not endanger new, the new york times or the washington post it, it would bolster them is well, if, i i went talking about two different things here Right, I'm exactly. talking That's about the, the case was decided by the Supreme Court right. some think, time I ago. Think, and I and think that, the only that, thing that could protect them would be Trump not getting into office. Because if he did, I, did, I mean, there is still the First Amendment, right? And so that's difficult. It's easier for him to come after us as professors and tenure and, you know, move this through the state thing than to attack the biggest media companies. The smaller ones like Civil Beat are more vulnerable because they have less deep pockets for legal defense. But but on the other side of the ledger, if there's no legal and, and collective public recognition that Elon Musk is responsible for the garbage that shows up on his platform, right? And that's, again, a financial issue too, a uh, financial incentive for him not wanting to be responsible for it. If there isn't a sea change where we realize, no, he is a publisher. Yeah, see, I, what, you, what you're saying is that essentially the, that Elon Musk is actually protected, has more protection That's right. than the New York Times. I mean, he is actually excluded from the libel lawsuits. In fact, he that has, was... He has said, I will allow anything on X that's legal. So in his view, anything short of something you would say that would get you locked up in jail is going to be allowed on it. Now, he still he says that, but then he still massages it. He just was at a Trump rally this Sunday, and you know he's tweaking and curating his site to, to, to favor Trump. But he says everything, you know, short of what's legal. If I, I will agree with you, Julian, that it's broken. It's yeah. not working properly for many reasons and many expressions. But my question to you guys is, how do we get back? How do we get back to you know a reasonable um, journalistic um, environment where people write the truth and people want to hear the truth? Uh, and, and you're accountable if you lie. Really accountable. I, um, I know we're running out of we time. Back so could, I, that? could I jump on Jay's question too? Because yeah, Brett, sure. I think Go he's ahead. done more careful thinking about generative AI and journalism than anyone else I know. So I'd also like to hear how you think that's gonna work into the future media environment. What, is, what does AI mean? And also how can we fix the media landscape? In two minutes, no problem. <laughs> uh, okay, well, um, I, I think we have to, f number one, the fixing part, it, journalists can't fix it in a silo. Like there's nothing the New York Times or the Washington Post can do just overnight. Like, oh, we're going to change our practice and everything's going to be perfect. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. In terms of AI, uh, which you might have um, discovered on Kauai, they're doing an AI broadcast now where um, I, I, not, I wouldn't call them cartoon characters, but they're sort of realistic looking people 
are jabbering away about the weather and the news on Kauai, and these are just, uh, you know, fictional characters, but they look hu human enough that, and they sound human enough that it's starting to blur the lines in ways that I'm getting very, very uncomfortable with. And, and, and I'm also getting really uncomfortable with the way AI is generating uh, content that is getting closer. It's, it's sort of like in the uncanny valley right now, you can read AI content and still tell it's AI content, but there's going to be a day probably not too far from now where it's going to be extremely difficult to um, to tell what's what. And I, I think that's uh, that's those are the lights at the end of the tunnel that is a train coming to just squash us all. I don't know how to respond to it or get away from it, but this this is where the regulation, in my opinion, and the legal system and the government officials and the citizens and everybody has to come together and say, we got a big problem coming. What are we going to do about it? If we wait, like like social media is a great example that everybody knows. You know, we started out with, oh, Twitter, isn't this fun? You know, <laughs> isn't isn't a uh, Facebook great? And let's just let it be free, and uh, everything good's going to happen. There's so much great stuff that's going to come out of social media. All these First Amendment uh, advocates are thinking that the you know the, the benevolence of humanity is going to emerge and flower. And in 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 some respects that did happen, but I'd say it has not been uh anywhere near the utopia that we imagined it could be and in fact it's released these dark forces that i never i you know i didn't even imagine existed and i'm thinking with ai there are things coming that we cannot even imagine right now that are going to disrupt our society in ways that we we won't even be able to believe got anything to add julio um i mean i guess i i would say uh you know, I go back to the thing about I do see kind of a witch's brew between the, the the dark propaganda, the disinformation that we've seen, like during the Cold War or the World Wars or, you know, the partisan press. I mean, I see all of it uh, kind of given steroids a little bit by the media. I You know, there's a new thing that Brett actually showed me called Notebook LM that Google put out where it reads your work and then it'll create a 10 minute podcast in a few minutes. And it sounds like two people talking. I, I would say if there's some saving grace to, to some of this with AI, it's to me anyway, when I listen to these two uh, robots talking about the book I published or the article I, I published about Walter Lippmann, there's nothing that can replace a soul. And, you know, they miss a lot of the most important points in my book because they're not human beings there. It's two machines talking to each other. And so uh, it's, it's like in the science fiction that, that some of us know that, you know, you've got these cyborgs around, but they, there is something called a soul and it is missing from these robots, whether they can talk like us or write like us or not. There's, there's a, I don't think there's, there's something they'll ever fill in. And, 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 you know, the, the problem is, the the un you know like if you look at a lot of the lying that's going on now i mean it's not even to be partisan about it but I, I i might as well say it's it's coming from trump advance okay you said it it's targeted at the low the low information the people who are uninformed and unfortunately that's a huge number of people always and so i guess what the the concern brett is highlighting is that the number of us that are kind of awake and are aware, hey, this isn't a real podcast of two human beings speaking. These are two, you know, voices, uh, AI voices talking to each other and missing the central point because they don't have any humanity. That number of us that can recognize that may start getting smaller and smaller. And that's, I think, because then that, how do you sustain a democracy? How do you so sustain self-governance? when it's more and that's been an age old concern but it arguably there's a tipping point where so, a lot of our uh democratic theory gets outpaced by our technological advances so let me get one one thing though there was a, a suggestion that we may have to uh, as we kind of bring this discussion uh, you're suggesting that we apply the libel laws to uh, social media which are now exempt from it. 
Yeah, that's and the technical answer. That, that, that's, a, that's one thing. And then, but the question I would have is, uh, do we need to reevaluate our libel standards in general? Uh, in other words, answering uh, Jay's uh, or responding to Jay's New York Times case, do we need to change the standard for what is libel? Uh, which, for example, exists in Britain. I mean, the British have a, a, a different view. You tell a lie and that's it. It's not whether you knew that you told a lie. You just, you know, that's it. Uh, is that something that we should consider as well? well I mean, I think we, we keep lose the forest from the trees. The, the thing about Section 2, 230 and the libel vis-a-vis -vis the social media companies is that's the technical explanation for the fact that, like, Zuckerberg you know, these tech bros feel that they are not only not responsible for the content on their platforms, but they're now moving into an even darker territory where they're being mischief makers in it, mm -hmm. right? Active mischief makers. They went from sort of aw shucks when they'd appear for Congress. And so there is a libel explanation. Well, if you tighten 230, now you've legally made them responsible. But we don't have a public recognition that they even should be responsible. When I raise this question with my students and I show them what Musk says, they say, yeah, that's fine. Why should he censor stuff on the internet? You know, that's considered, he's, he's described that as censorship if I actually do responsible content moderation, whereas in the past it was done. And then whether, you know, Trump can come in and mess with the FCC laws or whatever to attack I mean, again, I would just say that the concern is with the smaller media companies. We have the First Amendment and we have, uh, you know, companies like The New York Times, MSNBC have the money to fight the, the Trump administration in court. So although they are under threat, and I don't want to minimize that, the more immediate targets are professors like us because we're state employees. If, if they get rid of the tenure system, you know, if you go to Turkey and Hungary, you cannot get in front of a classroom and 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 say what you think or you'll get thrown in jail. And if and and also, you know, uh, places like where Chad works, Civil Beat, the, the places with the smaller pockets for a full of, you know, knockdown, drag out legal battle. The, the, the local news markets are going to get cowed by this. Wow. Oh, boy. You got anything uh, optimistic, Brett? Well, I I think that again, journalists like if you say who who can fix this in the world? Yes, government officials could fix this, politicians could fix this, but if you're really going to say who is the most likely to change the trajectory of where we're at, I think journalists are in the right seat. I think people still have um, a degree of trust, and um, I think I think culturally, our stories, the American story, uh, journalists is they're usually heroes. They can be villains, but usually they're heroes in the stories. And that's because they come into situations where the government's failed, the all the authorities have failed, and they shine a light on a story, and then the citizenry. Um, erupts in anger or, or demands some action, and that's how things change. And I, I think journalists are in the right seat. Um, how we position that, um, you know, in an economic way, I think is a real issue. Uh, and then also, I think we have some, I think, roles as community advocates uh, that are going to be different in a new way uh, in the 21st century than we've probably ever practiced before where journalists will be pushed to the um, uh, place of getting the community together to talk about issues that nobody else will talk about. And, and uh, so I think those are some promising areas. Well, uh, we want to thank Brett and Julian for joining us this morning and, and stimulating this conversation. We really do. So thank you. Um, you guys can you know, disconnect or whatever and go about teaching young journalists how to be, uh, how to save us and the rest of us. And we're going to spend some time chatting about, um, you know, whether that's what you told us uh, has an impact on the upcoming election. So thank you. I just want to add that if, you, if you're looking for models of where journalism can go, Civil Beat, we're really lucky in Honolulu to have Civil Beat. 
Um, not that many places have an organization like that that is outside the uh, sort of capitalist system, not entirely, but mostly, and focused on creating, you know, the next generation of what journalism is. So I think uh, watching what Civil Beat does very closely, um, supporting Civil Beat, that's, a, that's an important part of what we'll be able to do locally. And then um, I think it's also a model nationally. So thank you, Chad, and, and your staff there for all the work they do. Thank you. Thank you. We are thank not you. sponsoring this edition of Think Tech, by the way, <laughs> but I do want to say thank you very much for those very kind comments. I could easily talk at length about things that both of you brought up <laughs> uh, but I know we have a show. Maybe we'll bring them back. Uh, I would yeah, we'll to... do that. We'll do that. And, uh, was, uh, and down, thank I you. I have a list of things I wrote down here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. You you and uh, and Tim Tim Walsh write everything down. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. We really appreciate your participation. And uh, yeah, let's consider you know having you back and also uh, any of your other colleagues who feel more comfortable in the future. Okay, guys, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're going to have Civil Beat around for a while. So thank you for that. I hope but so. But then, you know, we also have the Hawaii Free Press. So, you know, that's, you know I don't know what we're going to do with all of that stuff. <laughs> he even mentioned in the same breath, Governor, as Hawaii Free Press. I know Andrew Walden. I, I read his site because I want to know what he's saying, but... It's it's heavily distorted. It's heavily biased. I'll give him credit. He does stay on top of the news, but he then does his own spin of it. And sometimes it's just flat out, not sometimes, as often as flat out inflammatory. And I could go on and on, but it, I, I would not censor no, but it. I, I, you but, know, yeah. we are glad that we have civil beat. And, but, you know, on the other hand, not everything out there is as civil. And so, no, it's not. And, and Hawaii Free Press has every right to exist uh, under our First Amendment. And um, I would love to address some of the questions and thoughts that came up. Um, I see Julian and Brett are staying on. It's kind of exciting. Yeah, you can stay on and, and, <laughs> and, and, and hear the rest of the discussion. But uh, well, I'm uh, curious to hear what you're going to say now. So <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Well, what, <laughs> what thing like I want to get here. into? I mean, yeah, right in the show. <laughs> You know, I was following the that, that, just, just briefly, you know, I'll say I was just in Atlanta for the Online News Association annual conference, and I've been going to these for a number of years, and AI was the biggest topic by far, along with Trump and Harris, obviously. And uh, two things came out. Um, Julian, to your point about not having a soul, I was just watching Blade Runner the other day, the original Blade Runner. And if you remember, Rutger Hauer, the replicants actually do approach souls, uh, possessing a soul before Harrison Ford kills them. Uh, but um, it's, it's, to Brett's point, it's evolving so rapidly and, and generative is becoming the normative. And I do fear about how good it's going to be. I do wonder whether you can, in fact, pass that Turing test. You can have a thinking robot, if you will. But to one other thing, there is an effort on the part of journalism on what to do about AI to find where you can capitalize on its strengths I'll just give you one example. Remember that uh, the, the Trump campaign put out photos of the Harris campaign and a, a plane arriving and the crowd, right? Trump's really into crowd size. It's all about the crowd size. Well, the Trump campaign distorted the image on social media, uh, minimizing the size of the crowd. And, and so the question came up, can journalism put somehow label on that to, to much more quickly identify deep fakes, and, and really start exposing that. The problem is, I think most people these days, correct me if I'm wrong, professors, they're getting their media from social media and not the New York Times and, and not MSNBC. Fox News is still really up there, I think, in terms of consumption. But I worry that they're not actually gonna read those factual checks. Uh, I mean, the New York Times just did a whole fact checking on Walls and Vance during the, the recent debate. Who's gonna read that when we're getting our news on TikTok, what are you going to say, to, uh, Colin? I, I, I mean, I agree with everything Chad says. I, I actually, maybe I could follow up with a question since you're just coming back from Atlanta on that conference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the biggest struggle in my mind, and this is directly related to the work you do at Civil Beat, is is how you develop a successful um, business model for local journalism. This is what frightens me the most actually, not so much the national news, which 
has a problems, but I mean, I, the, at least the Times and the Post and others are still seem to have found a somewhat sustainable business model. But what about all these media markets where we don't have a civil beat, where there is essentially, there are no journalists left or just a handful who are running around trying to cover um, all of the stories as, as quick, quickly as they can, where there's no capacity for investigative journalism. I mean, this this is what frightens me the most. And, and in Atlanta, did you see any examples of a successful business model or proposals for that? I mean, I know the civil beat model is, you know, mainly through philanthropy, although I understand you have nonprofit, you know, supporters as well in the community. But is there anything, any other model other than really the civil beat model where you have a wealthy benefactor and that's supplemented with some, some community donations? What was encouraging to see was that there were a number of smaller publications, I'm using that word publication broadly, but primarily internet sites um, that you maybe have never heard of, and perhaps Julian and, and, and Brett have, but I, I was surprised to come across one in Nebraska, I believe it's called the Flat River Press, uh, and it was winning awards and producing terrific journalism. I used to live in Nebraska, and so it was so refreshing to see that these smaller this is filling that void that's being created to Julian's point about how it's going to affect these smaller communities. And that was exciting. Uh, at the same time, I, there's also business models that are going out of business at the same time. And it's not just having a wealthy benefactor. It is relying on people to care and to pay for news. And that is my other big concern. Yes, we're very fortunate with Piero Midiar. And yes, we're very fortunate that our uh, donor base is increasing and growing. But not every publication has a Jeff Bezos um, or the Sulzberger family in New York or, or the Murdoch family uh, with Fox. And I, I do worry about that. But the hunger and the desire to read those stories and uh, at the local level was encouraging. I would never have known that had I not gotten out of my Honolulu bubble, gone to Atlanta and met these folks. And that, that gave me some, gave me kind of a good feeling for the future. We'll see how many of them survive and are still around next year, including Civil Beat, fingers crossed. But you just don't know what's going to happen in this landscape. Jay, you got anything? What what AI can do, I mean, putting taking all the, you know, the mystery out of it is they can lie for you. It can come up with stuff that's not true. And then ultimately, somebody has to pawn that off on the public. Um, so the lie is using uh, AI um, and then propagating AI. And I don't know why, but I think of I think of Trump's recent advertisement that uh, Jamie Jamie Diamond, yeah. the CEO of uh, what is it? The CEO of one of Wall Street Morgan. Sorry, Jamie yeah, JP Morgan. Okay, endorsed him. But that wasn't true. Now this this is really um, worth um, investigation. It's worth some real reporting on the other side. There ought to be a scream and a cry and a shout that he would do this. It's a lie, major lie, and yet it got out there. And you guys know that you make the lie, and then somebody comes along later on page forty-seven and corrects the lie. The lie has a life of its own. People believe that Jamie, you know, endorsed Trump because they didn't catch the second story. And I think in part of the uh, solution, the clawback solution that Julian was talking about, is to really let him have it when he lies. And then we got into this rhythm of, uh, okay, it's false. All right, it's a lie. You know, he does 30,000 lies. We get used to it. We get numb. We fill up the pages with lies. And then every time Trump gets out there and says something, okay, I mean, he's lying. He said, how can you tell he's lying? His lips are moving, right? The old adage about lips are moving. <laughs> so, you know, somebody ought to really take him to task. <clears throat> and under the present law, it'd be very hard to do that. And, uh, well, in a civil way, those those women who sued, um, you know, Trump for the, the outrageous remarks he made about their work as a uh, uh, voting officials, you know, that was really It was really crazy. Giuliani. It was really Giuliani. Giuliani but uh, but uh, Giuliani is just a, an extension of Trump at the time. Um, so um, what, I, what I'm saying is there ought to be some mm, sense of responsibility. And I think you guys, uh, Brett and Julian, it's up it's up to the, the schools, but it's also up to the press, Chad, to, to, to nail somebody who's lying. Nail them. 
and keep nailing him. And not just not just civil beat, but everybody. CNN right now is running stories on how Trump is lying about Hurricane Helene, how they have been blaming Biden and Harris for the lack of response. When in fact, the news, the actual factual sources are that they've deployed all sorts of truths, all sorts of money. Biden and Harris have, invented, have visited there. Who's actually listening to that? And to Julian's point about the uneducated masses out there that are supporting, not only that, when they do hear it, they don't believe it anymore. You know, Jack right. Smith, with the new filing in, in the in the insurrection case, nobody believes it. They just automatically assume Trump is the one who's telling. You the know truth. what's interesting though is that a lot of people are going to church and they believe what they hear there. <laughs> the amount of money that's pouring in uh, for these ads from these uh, Citizens United super PACs, okay, th those are often untrue. They're lies, too. They propagate lies. So many ways to reach public opinion and, and contort it so many ways. And if you gave me a billion dollars, I could I could tell you the moon is made of cheese. The, the last people, people who talked like that was uh, Gogol's and Hitler. And, 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 and it worked for them. I mean, he, he didn't get, you know, he, he got to be chancellor of Germany by actually not winning an election, but saying he did. And then blaming the people who voted against them, you know, and uh, and 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 uh, oh, he thought vote. He just needed a scapegoat. That raises the whole thing about Plan A, Plan B, Julian. I don't I don't remember whether we talked about this with you, but uh, Plan A is you sit, the newspaper, the media says what what is true, what it knows to be true. Uh, plan B is the media gets compromised. Why? Why does the media get compromised? Because they think that Trump might win. And if he wins, they will be excluded from the press room. They will be they will be cut off from news, from press conferences. If that's a, a term of art that has long gone out of fashion. And if they get cut off, that's going to cut their bottom line. It's ultimately transactional. And so I think that's very intimidating to the Times, to the Post, and every other newspaper uh, to be threatened that way, to be threatened with lawsuits, to be threatened with being cut off. So you have to have a plan B. And, and I think PBS does this. Um, you have plan B is don't go too hard on the guy who's lying because he may be your next president. You know, real quickly, what is our prognosis about how all of this is going to affect the election? I think that the I don't think it's going to change much in the mind of the, the remaining um, persuadable voters. I think that the people who are our mega folks are going to believe what is coming out of the uh, you know, coming out of the outlets that will reprint whatever Trump says. Um, but I think that for a lot of the voters who are left, uh, you know, who are really going to decide this election, they are the disengaged voters, um, and they will. I mean, they go back and forth. I mean, they sort of believe whatever the last thing they saw on social media was. Sometimes that helps Trump. Sometimes, occasionally, it helps Harris. Um, I think it. But but I don't have a, a particularly good prognosis. I mean, I think this is a um, this is a long term problem that um, we we need to try to solve. Chad, you're you're the guy that's in the business, so to speak. And you know, let let's face it. Do you think that things will change if Kamala got elected instead of Trump? I mean, will the Democrats be any better, or will they have learned something from? Uh, the right wing. I can't answer that question. It's a political question, and I, I have to be careful about not crossing. And it's Kamala, by the way. Uh, oh yeah, well, <laughs> the wonderful thing. The I, wonderful I thing about that. I knew you knew that. I'll just have to say one point real quickly. I believe it's factually correct, and I'll, I'll turn to. I think everyone on this panel knows. Ratings and newspaper uh, reading went up under uh, in 2015 and 2016, and the four years under Trump they dropped after Trump got out. I, I don't know what the latest numbers are. I, I know MSNBC has been struggling, CNN, but there is back to that capitalism point. There is money to be made off of sensationalism, and even if Harris wins. The MAGA movement, the Trump um, disinformation movement is not going to go away. To Colin's point, it, it's going to be here forever. Ultimately, it's transactional. Ultimately, in our capitalist uh, society, aside from a few nonprofit news organizations, 
Um, it, it's a matter of money. It's a matter of the bottom line. And David Brooks of the New York Times wrote a book recently, and he was on a, a talk show to explain the core of the book. And the core of the book is that he's a columnist, and he walks around all day trying to figure out what his next column is. And sometimes he can't figure out what it is. And this is a problem. You know, because as um, as Seinfeld said, how come there's just enough news to fill the newspaper or putting it another way? <laughs> how come the newspaper is just big enough to contain all the news? Um, and the problem with David Brooks, and I think this is really a problem for journalism in general, is he's uh, he's got a deadline. He's got to come up with something. And sometimes he strains for it. And you can see that in his columns. Once in a while, you can see, well, this one, David Brooks really had a work to get. So, uh, you know, and, th and that's his job. And that's the newspaper's job. And that's Seinfeld's job. And so <clears throat> we, we don't have a model that really works. And I think it's a, it's a question of capital versus nonprofit. Uh, it's a question of training in the schools. Uh, it's, it's a question of trying to make people understand that there is a uh, there is a profound connection between the First Amendment and their future in democracy. So we got two more minutes left. And since Julian, you and Brett were nice enough to hang around, if you want to use it up, go ahead. So, uh, Julian, you seem to be uh, fidgeting. So <laughs> you got a minute. <laughs> okay. I, I, I guess I would just, uh, I just want to make two quick points. One is if you guys invite us back, or you want to have it, we, we didn't even really get into this issue of objectivity. You know, it was interesting. Um, hearing Chad say, I, I, I can't comment because I'm this objective, non-biased, neutral reporter. You know, that's one model of journalism. And where we might have seen a real problem with that is, I don't know if we'd call debate moderation journalism. It's done by journalists. So it's part of, I guess, what they do. That VP debate where Vance was able to say, well, it's illegal immigrants that are driving up the cost of housing, even though a lot of immigrants are the ones building the housing and no, uh, there's no evidence that illegal immigrants or immigrants in general are driving up the cost of housing or his point about Trump fixing Obamacare. That all was allowed to be said and you could put on your QR code to get the fact checking but that's the kind of thing that, you know, one of these models is is causing. I mean, the other point I just make to close out is like a lot of this is very complicated. You know, like when we say the four percent are uninformed voters, I was listening to focus groups over the weekend of these people who are still undecided. And they knew more about those CBS anchors than I do. Like they've watched them more often than I have. But there is a, it, there appears to be a general understanding now in our society that I'm going to believe whatever facts I choose to believe, and I'm going to believe what I want to believe. And a lot of people are, are coming from very different value systems than maybe the, the, those of us on the panel are. And so it's, it's really complicated question of how people get their information and how they process it and how all this newer media is. Brett, you got anything? Well, I guess I would leave it with the idea that uh, journalistic um, content is not like any other content. There's a responsibility, a higher responsibility. It's not entertainment. People want it to be entertainment. They want to be able to capitalize on it and sell it. It's really not its intent. Um, and that is causing some of the problem. And if you're talking about economic um, levers, if you're letting uh, Elon Musk run Twitter willy-nilly with no responsibility and no threat of lawsuit, and then you're putting him against New York Times with, um, you know, some protection, but not nearly the amount of protection that Twitter has, then it's an unfair fight. And that's, and we're just, we, we know who will win that. So that's what's going to happen. I think uh, we want to say thank you very much for joining us. And we appreciate your willingness to participate. And meanwhile, for those of you out there in the audience, remember, think tech and community matters, and there's an upcoming election in less than a month. Remember to get out there and vote. Aloha, everybody. Mm -hmm.